Welcome to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hemmerker. In each episode, she'll talk with your favorite romantic suspense authors. They will take you behind the scenes of the writing process, giving excerpts from their writing, and share stories about their writing life. There Abideth Hope by Sharon K. Connell While attending the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps program at the University of Illinois, Chicago campus, Lynn Temple witnesses the murder of one of her professors, an execution orchestrated by a master criminal known only as the Piper. Although his accomplices are convicted, the Piper escapes. Upon discharge from the military, Lynn settles on the beautiful Gulf of Mexico in Pensacola, Florida, and finds love. She also experiences deja vu when an attempted murder takes place at the hospital where she works. Is the Piper involved? As a storm brews off the Gulf Coast, rebellious teens, rave parties, and human trafficking add to the dangers Lynn and her boyfriend Nick face trying to help authorities locate a group of missing young people. Will they survive to see their new love grow? Hi, and welcome to this episode of The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hammerker, and I'm glad you joined me. Today we're talking with Sharon K. Connell. She is a writer, um, obviously, because she's on this program, <laughs> and she um, also has written a number of books in the romantic suspense genre, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun uh, talking, because it seems like she does, all, does a lot of research for her books, so um, welcome to my show, Sharon. Thank you for having me. I consider it an honor. So um, let's talk about... Um, the hardest part of writing romantic suspense. What do you find is the hardest part of writing in this genre? I really don't find it hard at all. Um, it, it just, the words just keep flowing. And um, I, I mean, I'm romantic. I like to think I'm romantic anyway. I should <laughs> ask my husband about that, but anyway, <laughs> and I, and I love to be um, on the edge of my feet, you know? Yeah. So, um, so you read, I mean, most of us read a lot, and especially in the genre. Do you have any favorite authors uh, in the romantic suspense genre that you enjoy reading? Yes, I do. The modern um, one that I can think of off the top of my head. I have so many favorites. Yes. <laughs> so I started thinking about it, and I thought, well, you know, Jackie Zack is about my favorite. Um, I have all her books. <laughs> and, and what do you particularly like about her writing? It's natural. Um, she's funny. She brings out um, the characters in her story so that you're, you think you're, as you're reading, you feel like you're watching what's going on. And that, that's what I like to do with mine, too. So I guess we're kindred, kindred spirits. Yeah. We become friends. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Um, and, you know, I think being a reader and an author you know, kind of helps us to connect with our own readers, right? I mean, because we read books and we know what we like. And so how do you connect? How do you stay? Uh, what are some of your favorite ways to connect with your readers? Mostly on social media. I mean, I have spoken personally to a couple of my readers, um, well, a few of my readers. But most of the time it's on social media. We live so far away. Right. Um, so, I mean, is Facebook your favorite? Do you do any kind of like Facebook parties? Uh, do you just have a, you're just connect on your author page? How do you stay in touch on social media? I, I'm on Facebook a lot because I have a group forum that I run. Mm. And um, I have an author page and I have a book page. I, I'm also on Twitter. So I do connect with my readers there. And then I have my website, and they, they sometimes write to me there. Yeah, I find that I was thinking about this the other day, how, um, you know, I mean, the Internet and social media have really made it easy to kind of, you know, connect with um, with 
you know, writers, um, of authors of books that we like. Um, in some ways, I think it's way too easy, right? You just have to write a letter, put a stamp on it, find the publisher, <laughs> mail it off, and wonder, <laughs> huh, are they going to get it? But now authors have, like you said, Facebook pages. You can leave comments. A lot of times they'll respond to that. Um, sometimes I think it's a really good thing, and sometimes I think, my goodness, it's created a whole lot more work for us <laughs> as authors to kind of, you know, That's keep track true. of all that. That's true, but fun work. Yes, yeah, I agree. It's, it is fun to, um, you know, to hear from readers, um, you know, because then you know that, hey, somebody's reading my book, which which is, uh, frankly, it's just always fun for me when someone says, oh, I read your book or I saw your book, I, you know. I think it still it still gives you a thrill. So how many books have you written, Sharon? I've written four novels, okay. one novella, and I have a short, I've written a lot of short stories, but two of them are in anthologies. So when do you find time to write? All day. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I retired from the clerical world. And uh, I spend my day, I consider this a job. So I spend my day working on my writing or on one of my sites. Yes, yeah. Um, so do you have a favorite place that you write in your house? Do you have an office? Do you go to, you know, your local Starbucks or a coffee shop? Or, you know, where, where do you write in your, where do you actually write? I have a wonderful office that my husband set up for me. And it's it's got everything in it. <laughs> like what? So, um... well, I have a desk with a hutch. I have bookcases. Um, I have uh, file cabinets and shelves. You know, anything that I need, I have in here. So, do you have most of your research is uh, found in you know books? I mean, if you're like me, I'm looking around my office right now, going, "Yes, I have a lot of books." <laughs> I can pull off, um, as well as, of course, the wonderful um, world of Google and other search engines, which um, can lead us down so many lovely rabbit trails and sometimes give us the information we want. <laughs> yes, I have all of that. I have resources, and when I find something that I don't have in a book and I find it online somewhere, I usually print it out, and I have a, a notebook that I made for myself on writing tips and information. Oh, that's helpful. Yeah, because sometimes you can't find it again online. I don't know how many times I found something. I'm like, oh, that piece of information is so great, and I wish I would have printed it because I can't. <laughs> they move. I can't find it again, and then I'm half right. remembering what it is. Um, and for each story, um, I've not for each of. Them, I'm not sure if I've done it for each of them, but for the majority of my writing. I've contacted people that I needed to get direct information from. Um, I contacted NAS Pensacola for um, the stories that have Pensacola, Florida written in them, and they were, you know, the military aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I contacted them, and for uh, the that I'm the story that I'm writing right now, which is set in Nebraska. I contacted the town that I have the story set in. I contacted the Chamber of Commerce, found a wonderful man there who has get, put me in contact with other people I needed and just gave me a ton of information. Yeah, I and I print that stuff out, you know, I, right. I print it out and keep it. Yeah, I think that's one of the, um, you know, fun things about being a writer Um you know, we get to talk to people and, you know, ask them these kind of questions um, and get the information. And you can meet so many interesting people, uh, you know, through the years, either online or in, or in person or on the phone. So it's it's I think it's one of my favorite things to do um, as a writer is that kind of research and connecting with um, with other people. And it is, and they are so willing to give you the information that you need. You know, they, um, like this um, man from the Chamber of Commerce, he's looking forward to reading the book, I think. Well, yeah, we can create readers that way, too. And, um, you know, 
I've had readers give me ideas for books or friends give me ideas for books. Um, my mom one time sent an author, this is years ago, so she actually wrote a letter. <laughs> so, yeah, there wasn't an email available it was years and years ago uh, for someone um, who had set a series, I think, in um, upstate Michigan. And my mom had lived there um, at one time and, um, and my dad was stationed there. And she had sent an idea for a book because this woman was writing a book in a series. And the woman wrote her back and actually used the idea um, in one of her books. So that was kind of fun. So readers out there, if you have any ideas, we'd love to hear them because you never know what's going to spark an interest. Right, Sharon? Yes. We love to hear from our readers. And one of the things that I, um, I've – every piece of medical information I've gotten – has either been from the people I used to work with because I worked in the medical field for so long. Um, but one of them I've kept in touch with, in particular, I've kept in touch with, and, and she is an e, she's a former ER nurse, and she has given me a ton of information that I needed for these stories. And she she's bought every one of my books. <laughs> That's a great compliment, <laughs> I think, right? Um, with people who know you and, and you're like, you know, actually buy our books. Yes. I'm always, always happy to hear that. So how do you come up with titles for your books? That's always tricky for me. Well, when I get an idea for a story, um, I mull it over for a while. You know, I might make some notes first and the title kind of comes to me. Um, it's, it's something to do with the actual story itself. Um, like with my book, There Abideth Hope, uh, when I was thinking about the story, because it's it's a, a suspenseful, very suspenseful story. And at times, the character, the main character in the story is wondering, is she going to get through this? And um, all of a sudden, the title, There Abideth Hope, popped into my head. And I try to con- connect the title with, a Bible verse. Mm. In that case, um, the novella I just wrote, my first novella, um, is Icicles to Moonbeams. Well, I couldn't figure out what Bible verse to use for that, um, uh, but uh, most of them are taken right from a Bible verse. Oh, that's nice. So, do you include the verse with, uh, like, like in the front of their of the books? Then, in the front and at the end. Okay. Um, the one for the novella, I just picked picked a good verse that I thought might be connected with it. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, that's always it's always um, nice to to have that um, you know that connection with our readers as well. Um, is there anything else? We're almost out of time, Sharon. Is there anything else about your writing um, that you would like to, like our listeners to know? Um, I offhand I can't think of anything. Um, I just uh, I want them to know that I love to write, and my main goal is to write a story that readers will enjoy reading. The most important thing to me is to get those books out there for them to read. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. trying to make a lot of money because that you know that's kind of a myth. With, yeah, <laughs> um, with writers, they think they're going to get into this and make a million dollars. Well, that's not that important. The important thing is that people enjoy your stories and to make them as real as possible. Oh, I agree, Sharon. None of, none of us really got in here to make money. <laughs> no, it's, it's and- nice if we don't lose money. It's nice that people buy our books. Yes, but uh, you know we're not. We would do, we have done something else if we'd wanted to get rich. Let's just put it that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and to make the characters real for them. So that when I hear um, one of my readers say, I I felt like I was there watching them. You know, that to me is the biggest payoff. <laughs> oh, that's great. And that's I think that's a good way to end our, end our show today because unfortunately we're out of time. So thank you so much for being my guest, Sharon. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, It was a great interview as far as I'm concerned. I enjoyed you. (laughs) 
<laughs> Great. Uh, you've been listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I've been talking with Sharon K. Connell. You can find out more about Sharon and her writing and books and social media links and the bio connected with this website. And I hope you'll let you join me next time. Now an excerpt from There Abideth Hope by Sharon K. Connell. As they rounded a corner, Lynn's eyes popped. A large vessel, which she guessed to be well beyond 100 feet, occupied the entire space at the end of a long pier. An elaborate sign designated it the yacht. Nick parked the truck and opened the passenger door for her. Isn't she a beaut? I'll say, like something out of an old movie. How many people will she hold? Near 100, according to Zack. After they bought it, his dad had the vessel restored, but decided it wouldn't work in their business. They run fishing charters aside from being fishermen. You know, take people out on fishing trips. So we had it converted into a restaurant with a decor consistent with the Roaring Twenties, the era when the ship was built. They restricted the dining area to the enclosed top deck, more intimate. A friend of Mr. Adams had years of experience in food service, as well as in commercial fishing, so they gave the management over to him. As they strolled to the vessel, magenta-colored strings of lights swayed in the wind on the back deck. Water lapped at the poles supporting the rustic wooden wharf. A mixture of aromas filled the air. When they reached the wide, timbered ramp with its rope railing that led upward into the yacht, a splash sounded. Lynn's head whipped around. Wait! She stretched her neck, searching for whatever caused the noise in the bay. Did someone fall into the water? Where? Nick peered into the dusky bay. Look! It's dolphins! And only a few feet away! I've never seen any in the wild! We see them here all the time. Guess they don't cavort around the lakes and streams in Kansas, do they, Dorothy? Oh, sorry. Illinois he snickered. After a playful dig in his ribs from her elbow, she moved closer to the edge of the dock to follow the bobbing marine mammals. That was your first warning, Popeye. I want a closer look at those critters. The ripples turned into shades of coral in the orange-red setting sun as the creatures splashed and played. Lynn leaned over the water, fascinated by one dolphin who swam under the dock. She took a step closer to a post and the heel of her sandal lodged itself in the gap between the planks. She lost her footing and fell forward toward the water. Nick grasped her arm with both hands and pulled her to his chest. He enfolded her in his arms. Whew, that was a close one. Are you okay? Her heart beat triple time as he led her away from the pier's edge. He unwrapped his arms but held on to her elbow. Yeah, thanks. As she held on to his shoulder... She lifted a foot behind her to check the two-inch heel of her sandal. Yeah, I'm okay. Heel's intact. She lowered her foot to the plank and smiled at him. What a relief. You came within a gnat's eyebrow of swimming with those dolphins, and you're worried about your heel? Hey, do you even have the slightest idea what these heels cost on nurses' pay? Nick laughed, and she joined him. But seriously... Thank you again for the rescue, big guy. You're getting pretty good at this. Miss Temple, do you solemnly promise never to scare me like that again? No, but how often do you really think I'll need rescuing? Lynn chortled. As they continued up the ramp to the floating restaurant, Lynn's gaze drifted to a large boat docked at the pier closer to shore. She stopped. A huge, dark figure sculpted up the gangplank of the vessel. She froze. Her pulse raced. No, it couldn't be him. Nick turned to her. Now what? Is your heel stuck again? He grinned. N no, nothing. It's... It's what? Lim pointed to the boat where the figure had disappeared below. That vessel over there, is that a shrimp boat? The one with those poles sticking up and out? Yeah, why? Just wondering. And they go fishing at night, right about now, right? When the sun sets? That's right. Zack says it's the only time he and his dad go shrimping. What's wrong? Oh, 
it's nothing. A fleeting thought. I'm curious. <laughs> Silly, really. Her mind must be playing tricks on her. Too many flashbacks. It was only a fisherman getting ready to go out, not the piper. It's only your imagination working overtime. That's all. She smiled at Nick and they made their way up the ramp, but her pulse kept up the race. Thanks for listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hammerker. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. You can sign up to receive notifications of upcoming podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammakerfiction.com.